Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're very glad you've decided to join us. We're doing a series of lessons on glimpses of our God, and these lessons are for study between January and March of 2012, and this is lesson number three, intended for study on January 21. We hope you'll enjoy our time together. Let's begin, if you'll bow your heads with us, with a word of prayer. Our loving Father, it is with great pleasure that we seek your name, that we seek to understand you, that we have come together to talk about issues that we face in Scripture. Help us to understand what you have said and understand ways in which we can make it clear to others as our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. This lesson will focus primarily on some of the core issues in the plan of salvation. Or, if you remember right, the word salvation in the Bible means healing. They require our attention, and I would suggest a fairly thorough investigation, because these things, there have been a lot of different ideas about what these things mean. And so I would like to start with a quotation from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, which says, Sin is so bad, so hostile to the created world, that only the Creator Himself could solve the problem. What does that mean to you? Is sin really that bad? I mean, we live surrounded with sin all the time. How can it be that bad? Well, it, it can be that bad if, um, say that you have a universe that's, that's free. How do okay. you deal with sin and have a free universe at the same time? Those two are very yeah. hard to get along with. <laughs> so, how does, I mean, what does sin do to us? Well, what is sin? Yeah, what is sin? The, the famous quotation is found in 1 John 3, 4, which says, literally, hamartin est in anomia, uh, which means, in Greek, literally it means sin is lawlessness, or sin is rebellion, or rebelliousness. Um, the King James, of course, says sin is the transgression of the law, which, by the way, is a very free translation. Not all the free translations are in paraphrases. Um, but way back in the Old Testament, Isaiah 59, verse 2 says, Sin separates us from our God. Now, if our goal in life is to get to know God better, to know Him, to understand Him, and eventually to be His friends even, then separating us from that God would be a big issue, wouldn't it? I like what Gary had to say about, about the universe. Mm -hmm. um, the universe was in harmony throughout within itself at one time mm -hmm. until Satan rebelled, as you, mm -hmm. to use the same words you just used, and that broke the harmony and introduced disharmony, if that's, mm -hmm. if that's a word. Yeah. Uh, it unsettled the universe, perhaps made it unstable. Mm -hmm. So from a, a very broad perspective, uh, it is a, a discontinuity in the harmony within the universe. Yeah. So uh, if, we, if we back off that far, maybe we can see what God is about. Mm -hmm. That certainly would help. Romans 14, 23 says that whatever leads us away from God is sin, and whatever leads us back to God is faith. So that suggests that sin and faith are opposites. It's an interesting idea. Our, our Bible study guide focuses on redemption. Is there a difference between redemption and salvation? Could be, and, and, and the way the, the word language is used, mm -hmm. I, I don't see that they're really in harmony with each other. From the standpoint, uh, salvation if, is like healing. Uh, it comes from the same word, but redemption. To redeem something, you may give something to a bail, uh, put up for a bail bond or a, uh, a, a pawn shop, yeah. and you redeem it by paying some money to get it back. Mm -hmm. But so I, I, it, those two don't equate very well in my understanding. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that like plastic bottles? You, you take it in yeah. and get redeemed. And yeah. Sure. So somebody's buying the plastic bottles back from you. Yeah. 
Well, that would 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 reflect our model of, may I say, salvation. Mm -hmm. If if we think of the Redeemer kinsman, mm -hmm. and we point to the Book of Ruth as the primary example there. Uh, we're, we're redeemed by Christ buying back from Satan or whatever, um, but that model doesn't really elevate us from from sinner to a Christ-like righteousness. At some place, there has to be some some healing or transformation. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's not a model I particularly favor although we use it to express certain ideas. Back in the third or fourth century AD, they really favored the idea of redemption. Um, the, the, the context here was that young boys that belonged to rich families would be kidnapped and often taken off in a boat and out to sea somewhere, and, and the price was very high to get them back. <clears throat> and people would pay, rich families would pay this money to get their kid back. And it was suggested that God, that, that when we sin, we have sold ourselves into the possession of Satan. And now God comes along and he pays the price to get us back again. Now, uh, <coughs> excuse me, there's some challenges with that because if you, if you follow it through, some people have suggested it works like this, that God comes down and he bargains with Satan. And he says to Satan, okay, all these people belong to you not because they're wicked, but I'll make you a deal. You wanted to have, you wanted to be in the position of Christ back in the beginning. You wanted to be equal with him. So I will give you Christ in exchange for all the wicked people. And Satan says, well, that sounds like a good deal because he's worth more than all these wicked people for sure. And so God buys us all back. He gives Satan Christ and then Christ, of course, dies, and Satan claims him because he's dead. And then on Sunday morning, Jesus rises in his own power and goes back to heaven. So God wins the great controversy by deceiving the devil. Uh, and that, that, that's not very that satisfying very either. And, and before it all happened, God told him what, it, what was going to happen. It didn't come, or shouldn't have come as a surprise to the devil. Yeah, the negotiation <laughs> part is kind of weird, too. It because, really is. Um, I mean, even now, c uh, countries won't negotiate with terrorists, mm -hmm. you know? And if d terrorists are worse than the devil, I don't think so. <laughs> well, the next question that comes up in our, in our Bible study guide is, how does the blood of Christ bring us back to God? And blood, as we, we know, is a code word for Christ's death. So his death accomplishes many things that, that do affect us. Some would say he paid the price for our sins. Well, what does that mean? He paid the price for our sins. What I do with that statement in my mind is uh, think of that baseball player uh, who comes sliding into home plate. He rips his jersey. He skins up his elbows and his knees. And we say, he paid the price. Mm -hmm. It cost, it, it cost him something. Mm -hmm. It cost him a uniform and uh, skin, knees, and elbows. Okay. Well, there's two ways you can interpret it, right? There's, okay. there's maybe more. There's, well, there's two major ones that I see. One is you got a price tag on your mm -hmm. head because the devil put it there, and the devil, uh, God, comes and pays for it and gets us back. Okay. The second one would be like a teacher who has a obstinate student mm -hmm. and that teacher sacrifices a lot to teach that student mm. so that teacher is paying the price to get that student taught mm -hmm. what he should know and to make a good decision on what he's going to do yeah. so well with the help of ellen white seventh day adventists have been given a broader deeper larger view of the plan of salvation which includes not only our salvation as important as that is but takes into account the great controversy in the entire universe, Dennis, as you mentioned. Sin began in heaven next to the throne of God when Lucifer, God's foremost angel, became jealous of Christ and began doubting the trustworthiness of God. He began to suggest those doubts to the angels until at least one-third of them joined him in rebelling against God. 
Satan must have had, used some very persuasive arguments in order to convince angels living in the very presence of God. Imagine that. So those questions and arguments had to be answered, and they were. And I quote from Ellen White, but the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. So if we only limit our explanation about why Jesus had to die to the explanation of what it does for our sins and how we are saved, then we're leaving out much of the picture. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. The, to this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligence of the other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. Now, if you're reading the King James Bible, you will know that there's a little men in there in italics. The italics in the King James means these words are supplied. The men is not there in the original language. That, of course, was John 12, 31 and 32. The act of Christ, I return to Ellen White's words, the act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, and of course women too, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and results of sin. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68.2. So I, that's a pretty impressive statement, and it, it tells us that we need, to look, we need to look way out, way beyond this earth to try to understand what all was going on. I think that's a, a very profound statement. Mm -hmm. um, and when I have read the first sentence, quoted the first sentence in discussions, no one, no one has ever asked me, what would be a greater purpose than the salvation of you and me? Yeah. It, 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 clueless we have and a with very, no curiosity. We have a very selfish approach to salvation. We think it's all about us. I hear lay pastors preach, say the only reason that God sent his son was to save you and me. Yeah. If we don't understand what God's agenda is, then we cannot explain his behavior in any way that makes him at least look good uh, much or most of the time. That people cannot answer questions about his behavior. My neighbor approaches me uh, when he learned that his wife had breast cancer, was just diagnosed as breast cancer, uh, admitted he'd been raised a Lutheran, but uh, uh, he said it didn't stick. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, the, the, the questions, the question I have is, if, if paradise was so perfect, why did God put a devil in it? Now, he's speaking of the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. if, if it was good, as God describes it, why did he put a devil in it? Mm -hmm. And I think that most, well, the majority mm -hmm. of Christians, many, many of them, can't answer that in a way that God, makes God look good. And I, I, unfortunately, I think there are a lot of Adventists that can't answer that question in a way that makes God look good. Yeah. Now, if we can answer that question, then all of the other hard questions become much easier to answer. You know, why the flood? Mm -hmm. What will happen to the, to the wicked? Why did Jesus have to die? But until we can address that question, mm -hmm. why was the devil in the garden? That is... I think, the question of most importance. It's all about freedom. And God would rather die than limit our freedom. Well, it's, I, I think it's more than freedom. Yeah. Love. Well, love it's, means choice. You have to it's, have choice. It's, 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 love. it's justice Part as well. It's, demonstration. It's, it's, he has taken his, uh, he is giving the devil the opportunity to make his Case. accusations 
against God. God has, has put him in a courtroom, like Romans 3. Mm -hmm. You take your case into court. And this is the court. This is the court. And he's, he's letting Satan do exactly what he's doing. Mm -hmm. He is making his case against God. Mm -hmm. And the universe is looking, and we're looking on, and we're saying, well, Eve said, we'll put it that way, Eve said, yeah, I like, I like, I like Satan's case. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm voting for Satan. Try it. Yes. Um, as, as Christians, we want to make God look arbitrary and say, well, he just needed somebody there to test us. Mm, no. Like, like, you know, some of these creatures are going to be defective. We got to figure that out. I, I, I find that very arbitrary, uh, and it makes God look rather hideous. Yeah. In our Bible study guide, <clears throat> it goes on to explain that part of the reason Jesus had to die is because he had to receive within himself the wrath of God poured out. And so we need to ask ourselves, what is the wrath of God? And I would like to look at a couple of verses that might give us a clue. The first one is right from the Old Testament. It's found in Hosea 11, verses 7 and 8. And the question we're asking here is, how does God feel when he has to turn himself, or turn away, or, or, or give up on somebody? <clears throat> and this is God's comment about the Israelites just before the northern kingdom went into oblivion, oblivion. Basically, they were captured by the Assyrians and scattered. And it says, they insist on turning away from me. They will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. But how can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adma, or treat you as I did Zeboim? Those are two small towns that were destroyed along with so Sodom and Gomorrah. My heart will not let me do it. My love for you is too strong. I will not punish you in my anger. I will not destroy Israel again, for I am a God and not a human being. I, the Holy One, am with you. I will no longer, I will not come to you in anger. Then if we look at Romans 1, we find another interesting comment about God's anger. God's anger, here it's describing it, is revealed from heaven against all the sin and evil of the people whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known. And then he goes on and elaborates in some detail. And then he says what happens when God's anger is exercised in verses 24, 26, and 28. And so God has given those people over to do the filthy things their hearts desire. In other words, God says, if you are absolutely determined to continue in your sin, finally, God will say, after, after working as hard as he can to bring you back, he'll finally say, well, okay, I'll let you go. And verse 26 says, because they do this, God has given them over to shameful passions. And verse 28, because those people refuse to keep in mind the true knowledge about God, he has given them over to corrupted minds. And it's very interesting that Romans 4.25 says that, um, we can look at that for just a moment, Romans 4.25, because of our sins, he was handed over. So God's wrath is his handing people over. This says, Romans 4.25, because of our sins, he was handed over. That suggests that Jesus died as a result of God's wrath, I agree, but what did Jesus say about, did he say, why are you persecuting me? Why are you torturing me? No, he said, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? So what God does here when he is upset, quote, or angry, when he exercises his wrath is he finally gives people up. Now that's very, very different than the usual understanding of wrath in our, in, in our day. And we have the words of Jesus himself riding into Jerusalem that week before his crucifixion, he weeps over Jerusalem mm -hmm. and, and says, how can I give you up? Mm -hmm. How can I let you go? I would gather you to myself as, as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. How can I give you up? How can I let you go? Now, Jesus, though, um, how does that, how did he demonstrate that since he was a, he was without sin. 
all these things that you've read here are people being given over to their sins. Mm -hmm. so, well, Romans 4.25, it says Jesus was given over, so he's mm -hmm. not given over to his sins. Well, so well, so the, the, the problem is just being given over. The problem is being given over, yes. And um, it's not necessarily a demonstration of sin, all except well, that, that that's fulfilling the given over part. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that Jesus experienced what sinners are going to experience. He took upon himself sins in a, in, in a sense and experienced what is going to happen to sinners so that, so that we can see. Mm -hmm. The Father treated the Jesus yeah. as if he was a sinner. Yeah. And sin has also a lot of collateral damage. Yeah. Sin doesn't just affect one individual. There's a lot of other people yeah. that are affected yeah. by it. Even the righteous are affected by it. My favorite definition of God's wrath was originally stated in various ways, but I like this version of it as, as, as expressed by Dr. Graham Maxwell. God's wrath is best described as his turning away and loving disappointment from those who don't want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. God's wrath is his turning away <coughs> from people who don't want him anyway, leaving them to their own rebellious choices. Well, another word for redemption or salvation is atonement, which really means at one meant. It means reconciliation. Atonement signifies the reconciliation between God and sinners. And I quote from our adult Sabbath school Bible study guide again, the atonement is so deep, so heavy, so profound that we grasp only what we can. Beyond that, thinking stops and all we can do is worship. How does that strike you? I hope our thinking never stops. If There's something seriously stops, wrong with our brains if yeah. we're thinking stops. Yeah. Well, I, I think of a family situation. I have a couple of cousins, sisters, who have for the better part of a lifetime been pretty much enemies mm -hmm. over various jealousies and so forth. But um, one of the sisters uh, experienced a family crisis and kind of woke up um, and saw that maybe things weren't so dark on the other side, if you yeah. will, and reconciled with her sister. They're friends now. Mm -hmm. They do things together. They work together. They play together. Amen. Uh, that's an example of reconciliation. I think that that's what God wants, mm -hmm. is that he wants us to be friends again, like Adam and Eve were in the garden, before they chose to align their allegiance with, with the serpent. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> you know, atonement has kind of a negative connotations to it to some people okay um, it wasn't until about the 16th century that it, that came about though right right I mean right now I'm saying that I'm not saying that originally but it's 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 almost like something you have to do to appease a god mm -hmm. the the twisted version of yeah. it and it's not very nice but <laughs> I, th I think it's just um, the atonement is just Basically, two friends that are estranged from each other come back together somehow. Mm -hmm. Something yeah. makes that happen, and um, they're they're back together, and all things are good again. Surely, if the atonement is the most profound thing that's ever happened in our earth, we should never stop thinking about it. And I don't think that prevents us from worshiping. I think the more we think about it, the more we want to worship. If something's important, do we un isn't it important that we understand it? Would, shouldn't we not just sit back in awe? We should do everything we can to understand it better. And shouldn't we keep studying it? Well, the Bible study guide says also, at the cross, in the most humiliating, inconceivable manner imaginable, God triumphs over and shames the enemy. Love, 
justice and compassion fuse in a single dynamic act. God forgives sinners by paying in himself the price of sin and absorbing into his own suffering self the penalty of that sin. On Calvary, God reveals how extremely costly forgiveness is. So how does that one strike you? What? I've been talking quite a bit, so okay. I, I would defer <laughs> that, let somebody else talk, but, but you have just raised the hackles on the back of my neck when, you know, when a Sabbath school teacher where I spent a lot of time, who was educated, who studied some at the seminary, says, the sinner must be punished. Mm -hmm. that, that punishment is part of, well, I'll justice. say God's agenda. I mean, uh, that's, that's... Justice, God's justice. It's, it's a his, part of God's it's justice. His, it's His justice, and that the price has to be paid. Well, we've already talked about that. Uh, paid to whom? Yeah. I think we've pretty much abandoned... And what was the price? Sin yeah. pays its wages, and that's where, where the, the verse goes. Yeah. The wage is death. Why does we have to make uh, God make it even any worse? I mean, yeah. Isn't it bad enough? Well, uh, I, that, that pay, his yeah. statement boggles my mind. Well, God is not just triumphing over or shaming the enemy. He is demonstrating to us the terrible consequences of sin, which He warned us back way back in Genesis 2:17. You remember that famous verse, Genesis 2:17. Except the tree, He tells you, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. Did God intend us to understand? that sin is deadly. You know, he didn't want us to have to experience, but he knew it was going to happen, so he... <laughs> and, and so then when the serpent says, hey, you're going to be like God, knowing good and evil, that was true. Many people, people you ask that, was that a lie? No, that was a lie. No, no it, it was... Later on in the chapter, he says, now they're like one of us, they know good and evil. Well, the, the lie was that it was a good thing to know good and evil. Well, <laughs> it well, turns out to be kind of a uh, bad experience. But the real lie was that you're not going to die. And that's what most religions have, have uh, yeah. subscribed to. And everything else flows from that. Mm -hmm. Well, you already mentioned Romans 6.23. My Good News Bible says, For sin pays its wage death. If that is a natural consequence of being a sinner, how can the death of someone else Jesus, be the payment for my sins. I mean, I'm not trying to make things difficult here. I'm just trying to ask us to think what we're saying. Sin is lawlessness or rebellion, as we said, 1 John 3, 4. How does the death of Jesus deal with or do away with my rebellion? That's what it says in Romans 8, 3. If this is a legal or forensic payment for a debt incurred, who is demanding that payment? And the... Bible study guide goes on to explain in this way, God doesn't love us because Christ died for us. Christ died for us because God loved us. The atonement of Christ has, was not offered to persuade the Father to love those whom he otherwise hated. The death of Christ did not bring forth a love that was not already in existence. Rather, it was a manifestation of the love that was eternally in God's heart. Jesus never had to persuade the Father to love us. Notice how he insists on this in John 3, 16 and 17, and 16, 26 and 27. Well, if Jesus didn't have to persuade the Father of anything, per per to persuade the Father to love us or whatever, does that eliminate any kind of intercession or mediation? Now, some forms of the atonement and some forms of understanding the plan of salvation have a lot of intercession and mediation. But what direction is that intercession and mediation going? Isn't it from God to his creatures? Mm -hmm. It's not with, with somebody in between his creatures and God trying to change God's mind. He's trying to change our mind about, his, about himself. Okay. This goes back to uh, the model of, a, of salvation, uh, the angry father. Mm -hmm. uh, we, 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 we see that this must have been popular when the King James was, was translated. You go to Romans 3, that Jesus was a propitiation, that he was an appeasement 
for the angry father and that we need uh, an intercessor to protect us from the angry father. Well, our Bible study guide just says these words, and because sin doesn't anger us anymore, perhaps it becomes harder to realize that sin arouses the wrath of a holy God. I need to explain see, what so wrath you see, is. Go back to your definition of wrath. That, that, that doesn't fit with that real well. No. Uh, it's, uh, Maybe not at all. Yes, you know. Well, my question is this. Is sin serious because it arouses the wrath of God and he's likely to zap us or because sin is inherently deadly? The latter. Because it's the latter. Should we be afraid of God or should we be afraid of sin? Could we talk? Go ahead, Jane Ann. Sin is deadly because there is a surgence of self first mm -hmm. over the principles of God's government. And that, that surgence of me first and self, that is Satan in perfect description, me first. Mm -hmm. And the more of that that goes on, the farther away you are going from God. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I'd say it's more direct than that. I think it's, it's further from the truth. God is the essence of the truth. And if you go away from the truth, that means you're going to go to error. Mm -hmm. If you go to error, you're going to, I mean, what's going to work for you? And as you, you go further and further away, it's just a disaster. That's all it is. And of course, selfishness versus non-selfishness is all within the scope of the truth right there. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, but truth is very important. And you've got to stick with it, or else you're going to fall off the edge. Go ahead, Dennis. Well, I, I would like to maybe direct our attention back to, to what God's agenda is. Mm -hmm. And going back to our opening comments, that, um, that God has a universe which has uh, got a crisis. That, they're, that they're, things are no longer in total harmony. And the consequences of that um, are, are, are very serious. Mm -hmm. now, if uh, we think of as God's law as, as, as rather proscriptive, that God doesn't want us to do this or that for his, for his whim. But actually, I would suggest that God's law is the minimum requirement for God's creatures to live in harmony together throughout the universe. One, one, one trivial example is turning the other cheek. Mm -hmm. If everybody turned the other cheek, we would have no wars, mm -hmm. we would have no fights, we would have a certain amount of unity. But nobody looks at it that way. So. I guess what I'm trying to say is that God's law is what it takes for a society to live in harmony mm -hmm. indefinitely, forever. Uh, and until we subscribe to that idea, there's going to be a certain amount of chaos somewhere. Do we really live and act as if sin were deadly? Well, wasn't that the question at the beginning? Mm -hmm. um, when you go against God, are, is the wrath going to be from Him being displeased with you, or is it going to be because you're going against the truth, you know, mm -hmm. like I said? Um, and that's, that's what had to be explained all this time, mm -hmm. because well, it, wasn't, it wasn't, it's not God's, you know, displeasure, and he gets angry, and then he, he deals with you, you know, because he's angry, but because um, two plus two doesn't equal five, mm -hmm. you know, type of thing. Well, down through the centuries, what we observe is that religion, religion has distorted reality, and we have tended to fear God and be comfortable with sin. I mean, after all, we're surrounded with sin. God's plan was for us to love Him and fear sin. But re religion has turned God's plan upside down. Well, you remember Genesis 3.15. Uh, let's just look at that real quick. Genesis 
I will make you, and this is God speaking to Adam and Eve and, and the others involved, the devil included, right after the first sin on this earth. I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head, speaking to the devil, and you will bite her offspring's heel. Okay? So what does that imply? Well, you might be inclined to think, if you read that verse only, that God is going to win the great controversy by the use of force. Crush the serpent's head, right? Is that what happens? If God planned to win the great controversy by the use of force, he certainly should have done it back in heaven at the beginning and just zap Satan out right at the beginning. Why go through this whole mess? There must be more involved. He wouldn't dare win it by force because if he did, then all of Satan's claims would be true. So how does God crush the head of Satan? He does it figuratively by convincing the universe that God's own way is correct and the only way to live by. Jesus had some words to say about that in, in a very animated discussion he was having with the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. It's found in John chapter 8, and I'm going to read verse 44. In fact, let me start with verse 43. Why do you not understand what I say? Is it because you cannot bear to listen to my message? You are the children of your father, the devil, and you want to follow your father's desires. From the very beginning, he was a murderer and has never been on the side of truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he is only doing what is natural to him because he is a liar and the father of all lies. Now that is some very straight, Language. There's no pussyfooting around in those words no whatsoever. Sugar there. Huh? No sugarcoating there. No sugarcoating on no. that. No. Well, you you ask how does how does he uh, crush this devil's head? Yes. How 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 does he do that? Uh, you know, it's like heaping coals of fire on <laughs> someone's head. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's um, it's not that he has to convince everybody that he's right, uh, at least in the short term. Yeah. In, 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 in the long term, he will. But Satan has made those charges against God. I mean, he was placed in the garden to make those ch uh, charges, mm -hmm. and now we're going to see who's right, you yeah. know, who lied and who didn't. And at the end of the book, we see God differently than we see him at the beginning of the book, yes. that over the 6,000 years or whatever, God has turned to deal with sin. And we now see a side of him that we could not see in any other way. So that we see God from a perspective, a, a much larger view of God. Mm -hmm. And whether it convinces anybody on this earth mm -hmm. is immaterial. Mm -hmm. uh, Romans, Romans 3, mm -hmm. uh, early in the chapter. Uh, but he will convince the universe and his objective. We, we have to hang on to his objective. His objective is to secure the universe, the harmony throughout the universe. And we see God differently mm -hmm. because of how he has dealt with sin, and we see Satan for who he is. Let me reinforce what you said. The verse said, Satan is a liar and the father of lies. The question in the great controversy from the beginning to the end is not a question about who has the most power. James 2.19, I mean, the devils just admit that God has more, more power. There's no question about who has the power. The question is about who is telling us the truth. And the way God crushes the head of Satan is that he identifies, he proves that Satan is the liar and the father of lies and nobody can trust him. And that's how he crushes Satan's head. Unfortunately, by continuing to sin every day, sinners basically are saying, we think Satan was right. So how, once again, how, the question, how can we learn to take sin more seriously? Well, one of, the, one of the passages in Scripture that the lesson focuses on is Genesis 22. 
That's the famous story about how God appears to, to Abraham in the middle of the night and says, take your son and take him out to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. Now we know in actual fact that what happened is they walked for three days, they climbed the, that hill, up on top, the father turns to his son and says, guess what, you're the sacrifice. And the son, of course, has already asked him, well, how, how come we don't have a lamb here with us? But just as he's ready to kill his son, he remember a ram was caught in the thicket nearby and God says, stop, take the ram, there's a substitute to die in your place. And the lesson's comment is this, centuries later another father would offer his son. This time, however, there would be no animal to die instead of the son. The son himself would die on the altar. The father would truly give up his son and the son would give his life. Now, giving up, handing over, that sounds like Romans 1 and Hosea 11, doesn't it? That whole story with Abraham and his son, uh, again, I suggest that if we, if we see what God's agenda is, that is providing, re re recovering security throughout the universe, this story makes sense, that God had something to say about Abraham, that Abraham was really his son. If we don't look at it from that perspective, it makes God look like he's had a bad day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why would he say such a thing? So we, now we ask the question, so who is demanding the death, or who was demanding the death of Jesus? And was it to appease the wrath of God? And if it's so, would that be the Father who's demanding it? If the Father really loves us, would he have been willing to come and die in place of the Son? And again, I find this very revealing quotation from Ellen White, the book that I may know on page 338. Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, humbling himself, the Father, not the Son, veiling his glory that humanity might look upon him. The history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. In sight, in hearing, in effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. So whose wrath needs to be appeased? Well, um, what do we do with this story? After Jesus had died, been buried in the tomb, rose on Sunday morning, and then there was all sorts of rumors going back and forth among the disciples. That, you know, somebody saw him, and the woman said, the women said he's not at the tomb, and John and Peter said they can't find his body, and what happened? And, oh boy, we're all confused. Well, on the road to Emmaus that afternoon, Jesus taught to the two despairing disciples about the atonement, and he taught them not from something in the New Testament which hadn't been written yet, but from Moses and all the prophets. He's talking about the Old Testament. So, we are told that he maintained his disguise, we'll read that in a moment, until he had explained the, those important points from the Old Testament. Why didn't he just announce who he was and ask them for their questions and give them the answers and prove that he was Christ? And they surely would have been happy knowing that he was alive and that he was there to answer their questions. Because they wouldn't have learned anything, they would have taken it in by authority. They would have been so excited, so overwhelmed, they wouldn't, yeah, you know, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have even, probably even Whatever you what say, said. Lord, that's, yeah. that's it. Going well, back to the point that we made a long time ago, we should mm -hmm. never stop thinking mm -hmm. and just worship. We need to think and believe and understand. Uh, this is, this the is the way God does it. Yes. And I quote, this is volume three of the Spirit of Prophecy written by Ellen White, page 214. Written, this should have been 1873, I believe. He maintained his disguise, this is Christ, maintained his disguise till he had interpreted the scriptures and had led them to an intelligent faith in his life, his character, his mission to earth, and his death and resurrection. He made that all plain to them from what scriptures? Old the Old Testament. Why do we have such a problem with the Old Testament? He wished the truth to take 
firm root in their minds, not because they're sitting back in awe, but because they're thinking very carefully about what he's saying to them, right? Not because it was supported by his personal testimony. God says, don't believe me just because I say so, but because the typical law, that would be the law of Moses and, and all that was involved in there, the prophets of the Old Testament, agreeing with the facts of his life and death, presented unquestionable evidence of that truth. Wow. When the object of his labors with the two disciples was gained, he revealed himself to them that their joy might be full, and then vanished from their sight. And of course, they couldn't even, they couldn't even sit still long enough to finish their supper. They were so excited because, why they were, were they excited? They understood it. They saw how the Old Testament fit with the, the details of the life of Christ. And that was, I mean, that's the gospel. They got up and they ran, slipped and slid and whatever, all the way back to Jerusalem. And they rushed up there and knocked on the door and said, guess what? And they told their story. Well, Jesus wanted them to have an intelligent knowledge of the relationship between the Old Testament prophecies and the New Testament fulfillment. Well, one of the verses that people very often turn to when they're trying to explain why Jesus had to die and what was involved is Isaiah 53, 1-6. Let's look at that for a moment. The people reply, and this is a, one of four very famous passages in Isaiah that are called the Suffering Servant passages. And this is the last part of the last one of those four passages. Isaiah 53, starting with verse 1, the people reply, who would have believed what we now report? What we're going to tell you is so astounding you won't even believe it. Who could have seen the Lord's hand in this? It was the will of the Lord that his servant should grow like a plant taking root in dry ground. He had no dignity or beauty to make us take notice of him. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing that would draw us to him. We despised him and rejected him. He endured suffering and pain. No one would even look at him. We ignored him as if he were nothing. But he endured the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have borne. All the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. Do we ever suggest that Jesus died because a punishment was sent by God? But because of our sins he was wounded, be beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. All of us were like sheep that were lost in each of us, going his own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved. Now what is the punish that all, punishment that all of us deserved? What is the consequences of sin? Separation from God. Separation from God, which leads to death. That's what should have happened. So Jesus did experience that. This brings up a conundrum in my mind. Okay. Uh, so, so going back to, uh, we are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. Uh, all the, oh, this is what, uh, all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jesus received punishment sent by God. That's what we thought. We thought. That's what we thought. Okay. Uh, what's the punishment the wicked will receive uh, after the, the third coming, you know? The same punishment that Jesus received. Why do we not see that? Is chastisement and punishment always the same? If well, chast you chastise somebody, generally for, like for, teach right? for teaching purposes, to make it, you, you discipline somebody and make a disciple out of them, they learn something. But a punishment, is, is that the goal of a punishment? Often punishment, especially punishment of children, leads to be more rebellion. That's the, that's the point I'm trying to make. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> so you're saying that um, you're bringing out that the, the text here says that, that the punishment that they thought was coming from God. Well, we, we think that, uh, uh, I think, we, we claim that, that God is going to punish the wicked. 
for their deeds and behavior. Uh, this is not this is not discipline because they're going to die and, and cease to exist forever. Now some teach that uh, they're going to turn on the spit uh, over the fire for eternity, but we as Adventists have 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 the loving Short view of view. God. Uh, he's only going to turn the crank for what as long as they deserve. Uh, is is this a picture of a loving God? Well, let's ask, what happened to Jesus? Now, did not Jesus die the second death? Are we not talking about the same death? The sin that results, well, the Bible says so. So, why don't we try and marry those two pictures? Mm -hmm. That what God is going to do to the wicked at the end of time is the same death, destruction, that Jesus experienced. You mean Jesus burned? It doesn't say anything about burnt clothing or smoke or... Uh, I thought the wicked were going to burn forever and eternity. They're going to be dead hellfire. Before, before the cleaning up of, with the fires. He, they're already dead. Well, not now. No. That's now, Isaiah You're making 66, God look 24. good. You're making God look good, Jim. Well, I, like, I prefer to do it that way. Well, I do too, but, but that's not what we generally teach and preach. I know. Well, when, when Jesus died, if you really think about it, the punishment gate came from people, came from sinners. They were actually the ones that were yeah. crucifying him. They're the ones that, that condemned him to, to the death. They're the ones that flogged him and everything. But the death didn't come from them. The punishment did, but not the death. The death actually came from God with withdrawing from him. RSV so, doesn't use the term punishment. It's used chastisement one place, but it does. It, the pu word punishment is not in uh, as the uh, good news, uh, which I don't find to be good news in that particular. Setting. Well, I'm trying to uh -huh. trying to think about this this punishment that that it says here that they thought God was given to him. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so. Well, you know, that's, we that's need to interesting. Move on because we're just about running out of time. While you're thinking about that, let, let's, let's look at what really happened. Look at Mark 10, 32 to 34. Now, here is Jesus with his disciples. They have come with a large crowd of people traveling down from Galilee. Now they are leaving, they have left Jericho and they're on their way up to Jerusalem. Jesus' last trip to Jerusalem because he's going to die a week later, okay, less than a week later. Jesus and his disciples were now on the road going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was going ahead of the disciples who were filled with alarm. The people who followed behind were afraid. Once again, Jesus took the 12 disciples aside and spoke of the things that were going to happen to him. Now, the, the Gospels, if you put them together, make it very clear that this is at least the third time, if not the fourth time, that Jesus has done this. And what did he do? Listen, he told them. We are going up to Jerusalem, where the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. Handed over? Does that sound familiar? They will condemn him to death and then hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, whip him and kill him. But three days later, he will rise to life. Now, there's hardly even a double-syllable word in that whole passage. Only a couple. Is there anything complicated about understanding the wording of that, the, the, those couple of sentences? He's gonna well, look at... If that at, doesn't fit your worldview or your paradigm, then yes, it's hard to understand. It, if you, if and it's, you, kinda, it's kinda built into the statement because the, the disciples weren't listening to him. Yeah. Well, Even though he was saying all this stuff, nah, nah, this isn't gonna happen. Look, well, look. They wanted a place to sit, make sure they were gonna sit on the right hand or left hand. Uh, yeah, they wanted <laughs> to be prime right minister. Over, according to this, they were right yeah. over their head. Well, and, and that's exactly what Luke says. Look at Luke 18, verses, verse 34. After re quoting basically the same story in 31 to 33, it says, But the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. What bothers me about this story is that they didn't understand, yet, uh, yet they had the spent rulers, three and a half years with Jesus. The rulers did. But the rulers did. The enemies of, of, of Jesus did remember, did understand. Mm -hmm. 
that he was coming back. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've already pointed out Ellen White's words that the plan of salvation had a broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. So what is the broad, that broader and deeper purpose? The questions and accusations made by Satan against God had to be dealt with. The entire universe is waiting for the answers. The entire universe had to learn who was telling the truth, God or Satan. If God cannot be trusted, if he in fact is not telling us the truth, who would even want to live with him forever? You know that, uh, that Ellen White says that Satan's accusations against God are these things like unforgiving and severe and exacting and vengeful. If he was that kind of a person, would you want to live with him? Well, I quote now from Desire of Ages, page 752 and 753. It was a sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. So what was Christ crying out? My God, my God, why did you abandon me? What does that tell us about God's wrath? We repeat, a careful study of these verses will make it clear that when God's wrath is poured out and he hands sinners over, as represented by the death of Christ, what God does is let us go to reap the natural consequences of our own rebellious choices. So what is God's love for sinners? One of the, why is God's love for sinners one of the main reasons why he's wrathful against sin? God understands much more clearly than we ever can the deadly results of sin. How would you feel if you're a parent, if something or someone was killing your children? Should we be surprised at God's reaction against sin? Ellen White said we should spend a thoughtful hour a day contemplating the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. Desire of Ages 83.4. Our Bible study guide says, left to ourselves, we would, we would be destroyed by Satan. Our need for redemption from it caused the painful and lonely death of God's Son. So God desperately wants to separate us from our sin. He, how can he do that without violating our freedom? Does he need to convince us of the seriousness of sin? By Jesus' death on the cross, he has shown us what happens if we refuse to separate from our sins. In the Old Testament, we observe that the children of Israel loved to claim their privileges of being God's children, God's people. But they almost in, universally shied away from the responsibilities. In a similar manner, do Christians rejoice in the redemption of God offers and shy away from the sorrow for sin? Think about it. See you next week. <laughs>